Spanish Academy. And he now joins us from his hometown, Bombay, or which has been re-Christianed as Mumbai. Uh, Ranjit, it's a real treat and pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Shadeep. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your warm and wonderful welcome. Yes, indeed, we go back many decades back to our first books. And uh, it's, <laughs> oh my goodness, blast from the past. Uh, but I want to thank you, Shadeep and Indran and Don for, for this invitation and uh, uh, Pauline, Tom, Marcos, it's a real pleasure to, to read with you. I'm looking forward to hearing your work, of course. And uh, welcome to all, everybody who's joined us from around the planet uh, this evening. So I'm going to read from, from one of the books you uh, shared, Shadeep Hanjpuru's, the most recent one. And uh, I'll begin with a poem called Man with Parrots. It goes like this. A man with two caged parrots waits for a megaphone to screech. He is flying out of a monsoon. He will land where it never rains. The man does not belong to himself. He did not script himself. He is the residue of his fingerprints. He is who his iris says he is. He's been recorded as a wavering image, opening and closing his mouth in ritual sequences that suggest speech. He has been waved through, no one speaks to him. He drags his minefield around with him, clearing a track through safe zones. He does not know that the sun will burn through his skin as he builds a pyramid in which they will show images of people like him building pyramids as the sun burns through their skin. Not Jin, not ghoul. He is Scan, he is Kota, he is Number. He won't feel the rain on his skin for three years he will have nowhere to go. Thank you. So from that evocation of alienated transnational labor, I thought I'd move back several thousand years, if not a million years, to the Stone Age, back to a moment where we have one of the earliest records of someone making something that exceeded everyday ritual at life and someone who produced an object that we could think of as art. So this is called Ivory Bird and is uh, set in the Swabian cave, Holofels. Ivory Bird. Nothing in the world except the rasp of ads, the scrape of gauge against the gutted mammoth's task at dusk I'm gonna read that again. Nothing in the world except the rasp of ads, the scrape of gauge against the gutted mammoth's tusk. Until you cup, cream ridged into feathers, wings folded back, legs pulled in, long neck, head, beak, a missile pointed at water far below, or the clouds, the first cormorant ever sculpted in the sky of your palm. This next poem is called Pilgrim. Did I ever think heaven would ripen its doors before their right season, expecting me to arrive any day now, my boots caked with mud, my coat weighed down with rain, my lips moving to sounds not tethered yet to chance, more hostage than pilgrim, telling my story in bursts, how I let rivers surge through the trenches, how a thrown knife pinned me to a farewell, how I shrugged myself loose and ran, a banner rippling in and out of air. My hands burning with colors I'd scrounged off rocks, shrubs, spiky trees, 
on my way here, leaving my palms on outcrop and leaf, my soles on creased water. These poems are, are inhabited by migrants, refugees, people of uncertain address, people who have to, as so many of us have to, uh, sail under borrowed colors or work through camouflage. So here comes Town, a poem called Town in the same spirit. In this town, ask for directions and whispers. Tell no one your birth name. Say you're on your way to nightfall. Buy more bread than you'll eat. Read the signboards forwards and back. Mimic the rare songbird hiding in a bush. Stride along the pipeline bridging the creek. Shuffle off the linen strap on the Kevlar. Play infidel on the hill, believer on the beach. Because one blue is so much closer to us than the other. On your knees, in the sand, and when it's time, pray you'll come back as pearl thread surf not driftwood in this town. I follow this with one called prayer. Don't ask for the wall of the skin to break, the light blue line of morning to be drawn across your eyelids, the first watchful parrot of the day to ambush you with prayers. Peel back every proverb you were taught to reveal the raw wealth of ardor until you find where the reluctant chronicler wrote, burn and dance because what is healed is dead. Excellent, beautiful. Thank you, Shadeep. How am I doing for time? Very good. Oh, you're keeping well, yes. Keep Super. fine. Okay. Speaking of those who go away and those who come back, uh, here is uh, a very particular kind of experience and uh, it's summarized in a poem called Table. Always make place at the table for the guest who walks in with a peony, whose exchange is droll for a twang, who once sliced the moon in half with a whistle who struck a vein of gold in his sleep, who goes red in the face laughing at his own jokes, and for the guest who left the house 40 years ago with a wooden bowl and a vow of silence. One brings you a charter of demands, the other a chaplet of sky flowers. This one's called Train. And I've, uh, I've been haunted for the longest time by the, the ways in which trains have played a certain role in crossing borders uh, that slammed down suddenly and uh, really marked the difference between, between survival into a new future and complete extinction. So Train, what was I thinking? The train whistle woke the whole town up. Good souls zipped fast into their space suits discovered no moon and lush flames swirling under barrels of tar lined up outside rows of houses steeped centuries deep in peace. A soul sleep elsewhere familiar only to livestock curtained from the falling axe and the sealed train that's about to bump west east across cratered plains carrying its death weight. Magnificent, well done. Mark it. Never forget the salt makers. They can trap the sea. Never forget the makers of flint knives, they can split the earth. 
never forget the spice sellers. They can tempt the tongue to sing. Never forget the kite makers. They can scissor the wind into streamers. Never forget the carpenters. They can build horses that breach walled cities. Never forget those who stretch hide into leather. They can craft drums that bring down palaces. Speaking of power and how completely power can be impervious to human vulnerability, as we see unfolding in our subcontinent and many other places, fire, and it goes like this. I never once saw any blood gush out from that marble lion's mouth, not when a boy fell at the barricades, blinded by buckshot, those faces pocked with metal seeds, those faces blurring in nailed eyes, not when a girl falling on a balcony cried that flames had swallowed her heart, a fire engine drove right past, bells clanging. And a companion piece to that called Hawk. Caught up on the wave of the past, a hawk skulls back, ripping the seamed and sutured scar of our passage. Its wings are lined with scripts no one can read, but everyone brawls over in this city of howling dogs and winning saints. The blood that spurts under its claws is common, the sort you could smell anywhere, the sort you can smell everywhere. Suffer us all, dear God of many names, to come together and feed ourselves to that insatiable beak. And I'll close with a poem called Sovereign. A number of these poems, as you've seen, have to do with the uh, urgencies that were building up and coming to a head. I mean, they were written before the pandemic really kicked in, but I think we were dealing with questions of oppression, of, uh, of ecological catastrophe. And this poem, Sovereign, comes out of some of those deep feelings of, of uh, how we're all united across the planet today, by, but by, by a sense of impending doom more than anything else. So here comes Sovereign. Plucking sunsets from the water, the horned sovereign half stamps, half slides across the beach, stopping to dig, claw, rake. What washes up is drilled shale, lost static barst from gulf to strait, plastic whirls in whose wake gagged dolphins trail, scarred humpback whales whose shadows will drift unmoored up flowing glaciers. What washes up is news of the cracked ice across which a shivering fox is making her way from Svalbard to Nunavut, leaving her paw prints on frozen currents to a shore stippled with burst nebulae, a shore that on a compass dizzy with wind scattered directions, she can and can't call home. Thank you so much for your attention. Brilliant, marvelous, friendship. Thank you so much. Marvelous. Wonderful, yeah. Randy. Wonderful poetry. If, if I may just start with a quick question. Uh, well, a quick question, slow question. There are phrases in, in each poem that are sort of stand by themselves. I mean, they are poems in themselves. They're sculpted in stone, you know. So uh, what do you do when you write something, a phrase? Like, why do you go on with the poem? Or, or, <laughs> or how do you know when to stop? Because uh, several of these poems, I think in each one there, I can identify two or three lines that I could just stay with and teach, but just on them, just as lines. So can, can you sort of 
reflect about that. In the, sure. The uh, Indran, thank you for the question, because uh, it actually points to one of my working methods, uh, which is that I do actually uh, work over a period of time with fragments and notes that just build up in notebooks. So often they just sit there waiting for some kind of energy to course through them and bring them together or to come together around some kind of like a magnet or a nucleus. So uh, that's, that's one of the ways in which I work. But also in this book, particularly, I think my, my project or experiment, if you will, has been to, to, to work with a language that is continuously in some danger of breaking down and then it pulls back again. So that, that notion of fragments being shored up, so to speak, I think that's, that's, uh, that really is part of the, the mise en page and uh, the kind of breath units that I'm trying to work with here. Very good. No, I'm glad you brought this up, Ranjit. Um, I mean, uh, we've been following each other's poetry for God knows how, how long. And um, initially, uh, if I were to track things down, um, your poetry has sort of assumed a form of wise ease. You know, oh my it's goodness. Supple, it's, it's um, easy on the ear now. I, I remember the early books were so, so overly erudite and dense <laughs> that people had trouble understanding what you were writing. Not that they don't anymore. I mean, <laughs> in a sense, you sort of sum it up by a, a phrase like, a shore stippled with burst nebulae. You know, it's got the entire effect of light, dappled light and stripping of atoms and bringing atoms together. At the end of the day, of course, you know, we are all held together, you know, with, with the proton, neutron and electron, you know, it's the same patterning. Sure. Talk about, talk about uh, your development with language because you're such a language, language oriented poet. Indran, of course, pointed out that there are phrases which leap out and could, could be poems on them uh, by themselves. I know we both keep diaries together and I remember you put it on t Twitter, you put that Sarnath uh, notes up yes. there and I have a poem on Sarnath and I was saying it's interesting how some things went into the poem and the other things weren't there. So talk about your work as a curator, as a diarist, as a, a person who um, um, amalgamates images and words, um, both centripetally and centrifugally, because I think those two opposing forces are very important in your poetry. Sure, thank you. Thank you for those responses, uh, Indra and Shudeep. Uh, to me, increasingly, uh, the counterpoints to my, to my work as a poet, uh, very generative counterpoints have been my curatorial practice, where I'm constantly bearing witness to images that sometimes defy interpretation. If you're faced with the work of an abstract painter, you love that work. How do you bear witness to it? Uh, there's something there that resists language. Or uh, uh, a tantric Devi from the sixth century uh, who is present to us, but without a context. So you evolve different ways of bearing witness. And I think that's been really important to me. The other counterpoint to, uh, to, to my writing uh, is, is translation. I find it immensely fruitful, I think, to work uh, in a space between languages, to carry across uh, things I learn in another language or whilst crafting, uh, bringing that, that, that poetry across into, into English. And uh, in, in some sense, this book too, uh, I think benefits from that to a certain extent. And maybe the entire development in some strange way has, has, uh, has uh, come, come about through a certain apprenticeship to translation. Uh, you know, from the sense that you wanted to speak in a, or I wanted to speak in this, uh, what, what a commentator described as a fiendishly obscure voice to this sense that honestly, we as poets now need to recover the role we once had in society as, as shamanic figures, as people who spoke for and with others. And increasingly our destiny is the destiny of being one among multitudes. So how do we open up our own language? How do we make it both familiar and strange whilst we're doing that? I mean, I, I think for me, it's, it's really a question of no longer being caught up with the sovereign I, but to see how that I is already 
interconnected with so many different fates and destinies and predicaments. And how does language then reflect that? That's one of my key questions. It, mu it must be a wonderful feeling to sense, uh, to see the evolution in your own work. I mean, to feel it uh, in each poem, in each line. I mean, this is a, a major book you've produced here. And, and I, I'm coming to your work without having, you know, known that early period. So I, uh, you know, great. I think that's, that's what we need. We need poets who are speaking in the language of our time, uh, reaching economists and, and ecologists and, and bus drivers all, you know, I mean, there is a certain literature, literateness that one needs to have to be able to read, but, but I think you're writing in a language that's very accessible and intelligible. And you're writing from different traditions and two different traditions as well, I mean, not, and which is, I mean, we can come back to this later, but I'd like us to think about, you know, to whom we're writing for and in, and in which traditions, because of course you, you have all of the, the Indian traditions, but then you, you also have poets like Ted Hughes influencing, you know, coming into your hawk or something. I mean, just, I'm just thinking out loud, but I mean, I hear and see um, ecological concerns that, that you know, right. bring your poetry to, to poets from um, different traditions, different parts of the world. And, uh, anyway, so it's it's uh, it's, and I'm also interested to learn about Don Morais, who I, I had the pleasure of sharing a, a column space with at one time in the Hindu many years ago, and right. I always enjoyed his poetry, and, and really must get hold of your book, or your your complete poems, or collected poems, or, because he, he a great poet and, and and a pioneer also in English poetry, in Indian poetry, in English. So I'm curious to know about your relationship to him and what, how you came to be his sort of editor and, and curator. And, uh, you know, I realize we're short on time, but your work as a curator is fascinating, very serendipitous with our next poet, because um, Pauline is, is both a painter and a poet and, um, and has a, a strong career sort of developing in both, both areas. Uh, Sudip, shall I shall we go on then to Pauline now and well, then come back? Well, just one more comment and then we should move on to Pauline yeah. because we can always come back because that's right. why it's a good thing to keep these programs open ended. Uh, one of the things I do want to point out um, with Ranjit's new book, Hajj Prose, is the fact that you know the book itself is about 140 pages printed, bound. Um, the page extent is yeah. that much, but actually about 45 percent of the book is blank. So there are pretty much every poem is preceded by a blank page or there's a blank obverse page, uh, which is of course tactical in many ways. We'll talk about that much later, but you know, the element of typography, white space, uh, all that sort of feeds in. And I think that'll feed in with Pauline as well, because many of us are working across various kinds of uh, forms, both photographic, cinematic, curatorial, and artistic. So uh, we'll get back to that. But I thought it's important to point it out because some people said, what happened to the printers? You know, when you see the book first time, all these blank pages. Well, there. We must remember that back in the 18th century, Lawrence Stern, you know, left a page blank and think in his uh, Tristram Shandy. So <laughs> um, well, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much, Ranjit. Wonderful kickoff and, and brilliant uh, introduction today. Um, I'm really always cheered by this, these readings. They, they, they feed me for uh, days and weeks <laughs> to come. Um, let's move on to Pauline Leroy. Pauline Leroy is a dear friend, um, a poet, a painter from Chile, that amazing country that produced Pablo Neruda and Gabriela Mistral among, just among its Nobel Prize winners. But, uh, you know, there are so many great poets from Chile, and it's a country that's fascinated me uh, personally as a diplomat. I try to move from to Chile, uh, sort of repeating, doing the reverse from Neruda, where he went to Salon, my birthplace. In any case, I came across Pauline Leroy's work by accident, and then we became friends, and um, she has a uh, a secret life as a as Marina de Germain, which is a, a 
a name under which he has published a couple of books as well. As I mentioned, a poet, a painter, a sculptor, and a creator of video art and audio poetry. She belongs to the, you know, the style writers of Chile and also the Association of Painters and Sculptors of Chile. Uh, she's also a proselytizer in that sense for her art uh, for, and for art uh, writing and painting, not only her own work, but the work of her compatriots. Um, she has published nine poetry collections and a book about her visual art. Um, and these have been published in the US, in Chile, in Spain, and in France. Her published books include Magma, uh, from, uh, published in Chile in 2009. Uh, Himinam uh, in 2011, Bulom in 2013, and many others. Um, and the book that we'll be reading from today, which uh, I've had the pleasure and honor of translating and working on the translation, it's a work in progress, um, Obscena Sabiduria, uh, which uh, came out last year in Spain. And uh, we'll be reading uh, some of uh, poems from this book and uh, along with my my versions in English. Um, and we'll be reading first in, in the original Spanish and then followed by the translation. Uh, Pauline, would you like to go ahead? And thank you. Thank you, Indran. Um, hello, friends. This reading is a great moment for me today with, with the important poets Ranjit, Hoscott, Marcos Ayrton and Thomas Edward Phillips. I want to say thank you to Don Krieger, uh, Mr. Sadden Sin, and the poet and diplomat and my translator, traductor is um, Mr. Indran. Thank you. Um, this is a very important invitation to me to read today. And I will read my poems uh, in Spanish, my native language and Indran will translate it for you. And uh, these poems came from the, my book, uh, my book it calls uh, Obscena Sabiduria. It means obscene wisdom. And I will read a poem in Spanish for you. Thank you to all. El poema lleva por título Imen Natural. Vengo llegando de una vida larga, muchos metros de momentos, no quietos, esparcidos, torbellinos, que salieron en busca de la infancia. Esa lancha, ese ojo, ese sonido, manto blanco, virgen de huida y abnegada por un imen natural, a presión nuclear y embrutecida más, por siempre suave, con manos poderosas, con dientes de sables, barcazas cruzando, un estrecho de isla y continente que fueron lentamente dando metros y metrallas a los ojos de una niña que no comprendía nada. Natural Hymen. I have come from a long life many meters of unquiet moments stretched out whirlwinds that went in search of infancy that boat that eye that sound white cloak virgin of flight denied by a natural hymen with a nuclear pressure brutalized but always smooth with powerful hands saber-toothed barges crossing a spit of island and continent that was slowly shaped in meters and shrapnel in the eyes of a girl who understood nothing. El poema lleva por título De mi terciopelo bajan duendes con agallas magníficas. De mi terciopelo bajan duendes con agallas magníficas. Cientos de ancianos nos comprimen, atrofian, el astuto de venir. Los chillidos no se oyen, sin embargo, dentro de ti los puedo ver. En la orilla de mi mundo oceánico, 
los destellos se apresuran sobre mí, tu sonrisa acaba siempre lejos, los faroles de neón ríen de la encrucijada, refulgiendo mi corazón duele con el hielo, que lo quema lentamente y no muero, porque el alma está al fondo del abismo, donde un día cubicaron mis latidos. Te recuerdo abriendo en busca de mí, y luego al olvidarte no hay cajas ni chalecos, y desnudos nos paseamos al igual que el día cero, cuando fuimos menos y de regalo obtuve el crujiente sonido de mi tanque corazón. From my velvet genies step down with magnificent desires. From my velvet genies step down with magnificent desires. Hundreds of the old compressors stunt the astute becoming. We do not hear the screams, however, within you I can see them. On the shore of my oceanic world, flashes rush over me. Your smile finishes far away, always the lighthouses of neon smile about the crossroads. Shining, my heart is in pain with ice that burns it slowly, and I do not die because the soul has reached the bottom of the abyss where one day my heartbeats were measured. I remember opening in search of me and then on forgetting you, there are no boxes or vests and nude we stroll just like the day zero when we were less. And as a gift, I received the crushing sound of my tank heart. El poema lleva por título Marvelous. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. El poema lleva por título Fiesta de Fantasmas. De mis moléculas tibias vienes a nacer, desde mis lunas apareces, luna repartida, hermana, desde mi nombre desenvaino la espada, la abro con cuidado de hada, solo para observarla. ¿Será que en algún momento deba activarla? Tu nombre desvanecido surge a la vera del camino. Una ruta sin vereda ni definición verdadera. Libre del despilfarro de aquello codiciado por tantos. Algo vacío que se piensa por lleno. Vengo llegando de una fiesta de fantasmas y ninguno se parecía a ti. Estos eran de venganza, de tristeza, de lo no comprendido. Pero tú eres diferente. Solo hay una cosa entre ellos y tú. Solo una cosa en común y en donde se conjuntan por instantes. Y no es realmente una cosa. Es una molécula de afán y afable intención. Lo seriamente común entre los fantasmas y tú. So you. Ghost party. From my lukewarm molecules you are born. From my moons you appear, boon shared sister. From my name I unsheathe the sword. I open it with the care of a fairy, only to look at it. At some point should I activate it? Your faded name will surge on the edge of the road, a route without pavement, nor true definition free of pilfering of what is so desired by so many, an emptiness that thinks itself full. I come from a party of ghosts, and no one looked like you. These came from vengeance, sadness of the not understood. But you are different. There is only one thing between them and you, me. El poema lleva por título Hágase tu luz lejana. La noche oscura del alma se aclara durante su trayecto espiritual y la metafísica es fácil entrando en asuntos misteriosos de buena cepa y de energía luminar de un sol constelar que no es este ni ninguno sino un ave o un aire santo de extrema divinidad. Hágase tu luz lejana, 
la palabra en las bocas tristes de paisajes aún tranquilos. Despierta el alma de su noche y lo hace llena de luz de otros bordes, aludiendo al instante del sumario pausado y anexado en racimos de expandidos levantes. Um, this one's called Make Your Far Away Light. The soul's dark night clarifies during its spiritual journey, and metaphysics is easy, entering into mysterious subjects of good vintage and luminous energy of a sun and its constellation that is not this or anything but a bird or a saintly air of extreme divinity make your far away light the word in sad mouths of still tranquil landscapes wake up the soul of the night and fill it with light from other borders alluding to the instant of the summary paused and annexed in vines of expanded eastern winds. El poema lleva por título Haz como, haz como si nunca me hubieses conocido, siquiera ensayado, como las hojas que nunca miramos y ya se han ido. Haz que cuando me viste yo no estaba, solo fui la acción de una mujer desesperada. Y cuando tus pensamientos de horizontes fijos se crucifiquen a sí mismos una noche desesperanzada, entonces será que unidos, tan unidos, estamos desde ese olvido que de algún recuerdo volveremos resurgidos. Um, the title, uh, this one is Act as if. Act as if you would have never met me not even tried as the leaves that we never see that have gone. Act as if when you saw me, I was not there. I was only the action of a desperate woman. And when your thoughts of fixed horizons crucify themselves on a desperate night, then we will be united. So united we have become since that forgetting, which might give some memory from which we will return resurgent. El poema lleva por título Lápida. Aun cuando no termine de morir, sigo reclinando mi espalda sobre el taburete que en su erguida forma muestra mis fechas y nombres como acto de fe. La lápida dice que existió un día en que morí de a poco cuando las ballenas daban hermosos saltos en un rincón del océano en donde nunca hubo alguien que las pudiese ver. Tombstone. Even when I have not finished dying, I continue to recline my back on the stool that in its erect form shows my dates and names like an act of faith. The tombstone says that one day existed when I died a little, when whales slept beautifully in a corner of the ocean where no one could ever see them. El poema lleva por título Me ahogo a nado. Nervios de acero para alguien tan pequeño, tan de piel, tan de dedos. Cables de metal y plástico para este ser de venas y de sangre. Palabras para mi expresión y luego el silencio que recorre mi ojo y mi verso causando el descontrol de nendritas en calidad de auxiliantes. Duelen mucho los nervios porque no son de acero y brillan como si lo fuesen y luego el desmayo entero que no apaga nada de las venas vivas con las que me recupero, sola y sin pecado, sola y tan sola que me ahogo a nado. Um, the penultimate poem, I drown swimming. Nerves of steel for someone so small so leathery, so many fingers, metal and plastic cables for this being of veins and blood, words for my expression, and then silence that runs over my eye and verse, causing the abandon of dendrites and the quality of auxiliaries. The nerves hurt a lot, 
because they're not made of steel and they shine as if they were and then the complete fainting that wipes nothing out of the living veins with which I recover alone and without sin alone and so alone that I drown swimming. El poema lleva por título Todo se marchita, ven pronto a jugar. Jardines en donde das vueltas observando la estética de las flores y su simple despliegue. El tiempo es corto, todo se marchita, ven pronto a jugar. Libera tus instintos de los tallos que no explican el porqué de lo lento y de pronto una inmensidad. Debes reunir las gacelas que vuelan por sobre tu hogar. Los colores que no quieres habitar debes continuar. Alma de fuego, ven pronto a jugar. Distraído sonríes, no olvides corretear. Nuestros sueños abatidos que en rondas divertidas dijeron eternidad. No permitas que tras tiendas nos destruyan. Tiempo ido, no te vayas, ven, ven pronto a jugar. And uh, this, the last, uh, the selection of today, everything wilts, come soon to play. Gardens where you turn about, observing the aesthetics of flowers and their simple unfolding. Time is short, everything wilts, come soon to play. Free your instincts from the stems that do not explain the why of the slow and suddenly an immensity You ought to gather the gazelles that fly over your home, colors you do not wish to inhabit. You must continue. Soul of fire, come soon to play. Distracted, you smile. Don't forget to chase our dreams cut down that in happy rounds they called eternity. Don't permit the back rooms destroy us. Time that is gone, don't go. Come, come soon to play. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to all. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Marvelous. You know, it, it just takes your breath away. It, it's um, Ranjit's poems followed by yours. I mean, you know, you've set the bar so, so high. Um, I must say, you know, the translations in English are equally <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, um, the poems, to me, simultaneously explode and implode. Mm. They're both about myth and memory, of course, which you excavate with great uh, f felicity and, um, and obscene wisdom. What a brilliant title for a book. Yeah. And then, of course, you go on with magnificent desire, you know. So tell us a little bit about the way you use the trope of erotic or erotica, but it's so subliminal and so beautifully um, sort of couched in your larger uh, questions of myth and memory and uh, larger issues of language and art. Indran, if you can help me with the translation of the, the <laughs> say, Shudin. <laughs> sure, I can try, of course. Okay. <laughs> I, I better be able to, otherwise I better <laughs> retire from the job. <laughs> Go ahead, Pauline, adelante. Puedes hablar en español si quieres o responder o como. Tú tendrías que traducirme después, pero el título del libro, Obscena Sabiduría, Obscene Wisdom, eh, surgió, no sé cómo, en realidad, de, del mismo libro, del material que había en el libro. Ok, the, uh, un segundo. She, she's saying that the title of Seen Wisdom, she's not sure how it came about, except it came about from the, the, say, the very book in which it appeared. It sort of came naturally from the material that she was writing. Adelante. Sí, y bueno, en cuanto al... al, al a la sensualidad o el erotismo que pueda tener el libro y esos poemas. Eh, y se relaciona también con lo orgánico del cuerpo, con lo orgánico también de, de, del cuerpo, las venas, la sangre, pero también 
con lo orgánico del alma y también de la, de la sensación o el deseo del amor. Ok. Uh, so she's talking about the, the sensuality and the eroticism in the book sort of coming out organically out of the, the body, out of, out of the blood, out of the movements, uh, of, uh, of, of biological movements of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the body. And she's, but they also come sort of organically out of the soul and out of, so it's organic on, on many levels. I mean, she, uh, she's saying not just the physical, but, but a kind of metaphysical level as well. Um, go ahead. Sí, y la... Como pintora, eh, al trabajar con eh, pintura y, por ejemplo, mucha materia, digamos, cantidad de pintura, cantidad de pasta, eso es orgánico, es como si estuvieras tú, no sé, curando una herida, eh, cocinando un plato también, ¿cierto? Ok. Uh, as a painter, too, she's working organically with a lot of material, a lot of paint, you know, as, you, as she can see in, in her painting behind her. Uh, she's... Um, as if she's cooking a meal or, or um, I don't remember the other example she gave, but, she, but it's, it's, it's si una herida también, curing a, a, an injury, you know, putting a bandage on an injury, uh, healing. Yeah, go ahead. La poesía también para mí es orgánica. Es, es, Poetry es, is also organic for her, yeah. Como la pintura para mí también es orgánica. Y como, like the painting. Yeah. Y para mí, Todo es expresarse a través de ideas creativas también. Sí. Everything is expression through creative ideas, eh? both as a poet and, and as a painter. Yeah. Adelante. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Thank I, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you one more question, both of you. I mean, Indran, maybe you can answer this. When I was, uh, the two poems, certainly the two poems I had prior to the uh, reading, I was comparing the, the, the syllabics of both the poems and the original um, and the English are very, very closely aligned. Uh, were you uh, consciously going back and forth and making sure that it, the English should be the same sort of the line lengths and the breath pauses need to be similar yeah. or? Were you working organically uh, or in tandem? Uh, well, I think there's a, there's a certain chemistry between us. Hay una química entre nosotros, hay que reconocer. One has to admit, you know, <laughs> across the, through the windows of our world. But, uh, and that comes through, I think, in the translation. So it, it's yeah. done with a lot of love and with a lot of attention. Uh, but I'm also a conservative translator, which puts me into some trouble, I guess, because I, I want to try and respect the original metrics and, and the form. I mean, if there are five lines in a stanza, I'd like to reproduce the English in five lines and, and more or less keep to the, the form of the original in the English. And I do believe that if I can get the meaning across, then I have done um, a good part of my job, you know, um, but I do want the poem to have to dance in English. I mean, if it's otherwise, there would be no point. I mean, it, so yes. I, I guess I could modify the English a little bit. I did just just a little last night on one of the poems where I just I, I noticed that here and there uh, one could uh, in Spanish, the word would be depurar, you know, purify it even more, you know, bring it down to even more of an essence. And I think so. These are working translations. I think uh, here and there there might be uh, more distillation uh, to be done. But yes, to answer your question, yes, I try to correspond, and I think I did it sort of organically, but then consulted with Pauline, you know, on the because she does read and, and does uh, in English and can uh, give me her opinion and and does and did um, so. Um, and of course, you speak in English. I think you're being very. Uh, I mean, na naturally, the, uh, being very f a bit formal in reading in, in each poem, as you, but when you read the poem, there was this wonderful, you know, I mean, it was a beautiful reading, Colleen. I, I, I love the way you present the poems and uh, I'm grateful to have this chance to, to share these work with, with this wider audience. <laughs> Translation for me is, uh, as you know, I imagine a kind of re uh, writing the poem again, you know, in the new language as well, and and learning in a very intimate way the the my the what's be 
motivates the poem, you know, so you feel um, that you're in a the, in the mind and heart of the of the poet uh, who you're working with, and and so it's it's a good um, to have that experience. It's it's a refreshing experience. It, talking about blood, it's literally a kind of a blood transfusion that you're having in your in English, uh, because when blood is very much in this book and and the movement of the blood through the veins and. Uh, okay, I think I think. Um... Indran's, oh, okay, you disappeared for a bit, but yes, oh, yes, you okay. put it very beautifully. Okay. Um, yes, I think, I think, yeah, it's it's just the poems sang beautifully, as did Ranjit's, and I want to re-emphasize because these words are coming up, so I think the energies are all aligning themselves naturally across the globe and across the latitudes and longitudes, which is to do with organic way of working, uh, being open, and love and friendship. I think it's just so essential and crucial because the, for, the forum today is only being held together through love and friendship. And at this point, because we've reached the halfway point, you know, Indran will talk about how we started this series way back in 1990. You know, I was a student at Columbia University School of Journalism. He had just graduated the year before. So that was the connect. Um, and we started this uh, monthly in-person reading in my flat um, where we did these readings in a bat Indian Bathak style. So people would take their shoes off and come in and we used to pass a hat around and the people would donate money. And once we minus, not always, once we minus the money for the cheap wine and cheese, we would divide the rest of it to, to the readers who came and read. And we had a fabulously sterling kind of uh, stars, you know, all of them have gone on to like, you know, Pulitzer Prizes and this and that, you know, and so when we restarted the series online um, uh, in December last year, formerly of course January, we had a sort of a reading party where many of us came together. Indan, would you like to say something before we move on? No, no, that's all, that's all good. Uh, yeah, it began as a living room salon and uh, we hope that that spirit remains as, as we do uh, in, in this virtual series. And thanks so much to Don Krieger for his helping us put this together and make this available monthly. Um, so um, the only thing I would, I would, I wish you would correct is this business of paying ourselves first before we gave money to the poets, <laughs> for the <laughs> white. <laughs> I keep. I like to rewrite history. I think of the week we we did it at the end, but no, it's it was a good. We did collect money and uh, we did pay pay off the wine, so that's good. <laughs> Thanks yeah, so fact, much. At the, at the lead, and you will see, we found the original post poster we had made, and this was, you know, the days of. Well, I didn't have a computer then. I had a, a second-hand typewriter, but that typewriter had this sort of incredible. Um, uh, um, facility where you could slide in these different fonts, you know, so I could have italics, for instance, which was such a thrill. There we go. That's the, that's the, that's the original invite um, right there. And you can see the kinds of people who were reading, you know, Phyllis and Sashi Tharoor, Meena Alexander. Yeah, I mean, there's just fantastic. Everybody supported us so well. Yes, thank, and it, thank you very that much. We, try and, we try and thank keep you. that intimacy still alive. And the important thing, as we were saying when we started, was the only thing that matters here is the quality of poetry and then the friendship that ensues, both before and after. So we have to hold our hands and walk together. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And now um, we move to uh, yeah. Marcos. Marcos, yeah. He is the first Wonderful. to arrive. I'm, and I'm, it, uh, Indran will be introducing Marcos. Yeah, I'm very, very, very thrilled. Thank you. Mucho okay. obrigado, Marcos, for, for su presencia, Mr. Manian. Um, you know, I'm um, Marcos, I met in Brasilia, which is sort of like the center of, of the world in a way, and it's a new city, the new capital of, of Brazil. And yet he's uh, in South America uh, and uh, writing in. Portuguese, but but also uh, conversant in so many languages. I mean, in in Spanish and in English, and I, I I'm pretty sure he's he's good in French as well. And and he's a he's an ecologist. He's a 
he's many, many, uh, all the right things for our times, you know, both as a poet and his, his passions, his obsessions. And he is also connected to American beats, you know. I mean, he, he made the pilgrimage to City Lights and, and to, to meet and to look for Ferlinghetti. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a, 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 a world poet, I mean, in a sense that he's connecting to different traditions, including the American poetic tradition, the US poetic tradition, as well as uh, uh, traditions of Brazil. I'd be fascinated to learn more as we speak after the poems about uh, the influences and the roots of his poetry, which um, is widely available and he makes it very easily available. Uh, you can find his books uh, on, you know, in places like Amazon and so on. So, uh, but he was, let me just give you a few details of his life. He was born in Teresina, the capital of uh, uh, Piauí, Piauí uh, in the state of Brazil. Uh, he's a civil engineer a university professor and works in the uh, in the federal government of Brazil, lives in Brasilia, has been there since 2001. Poet, he also writes short stories and translates and he's an editor. He's also a composer and lyricist working with musical groups Bandana and Patua uh, and the Lake Street Band. So he plays percussion, drums. Uh, he's a part of the collective of poets and the cultural collective Verve Verde, and uh, author of many books, including A Vida Sente a Si Mesma, Life Feels Itself, A Tercera Margem Sem Rio, The Third Riverless Bank, Storb and Schotter, poems written in German, English, French, Spanish, and Italian. So you see, I was uh, being modest in the number of languages <laughs> to which he's uh, granted. Um, and composes in. Um, and some of his poems have been translated in, into English, French, Spanish, German, Dutch, Russian. He's a member of all the, the Brazilian writers associations and uh, the Academy of Letters of Brazil. Uh, and uh, he's a good friend and, 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 and ad, a proselytizer for poetry on, on the Brazilian stages and now in the virtual rooms. Um, so welcome, Marcos. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing you read. He's going to be reading. Are you going to be reading in the original Portuguese as well as the translations, right? Well, go ahead. You're, you're, it's your... Yes, I can. I don't know. I can read in Portuguese. You, you want to read in English? Uh, it's up try. to you. Uh, you'd be happy. I'd be happy to, if you want to read the English or if you would like me to read, uh, you'd let me know. But, um, okay, sometime I can read. Uh, uh, I read some poems from the my first uh, three or uh, four five books uh, okay. in the beginning from 2000. So you're, go you're going to read the English and the Portuguese, right? Or do you want, uh, or you're going to just read? The I can book? read the, sometime in English. Okay. Perhaps I will try to, to okay. read in English. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, eternal return. Poetry blossoms without an appointment, without time commitment. Poetry sometimes delays, even if it's planned with a shovel, with a roy. Poetry doesn't always sprout, even if it's watered with to time, water, or wine. Poetry, however, always returns, and it fills me with joy. Okay. And the next one is No, I shouldn't say. No, I couldn't say that what I feel now is nostalgia. No, I don't dare say that what I, I want is your softness. No, I'm not afraid to say that what I love is your simplicity. No, it's not for me to say that I, that what I desire is your freedom. Uh, uh, dia a dia, day by day. Good, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, do read the Portuguese as well, if you'd like, yeah. Yeah, I can read in Portuguese. I will try to read in Portuguese. É dia a dia. A noite de verão antecipou a imensidão do dia. Um dia comum de trabalho, de pequenos progressos, de deveres cumpridos, de deveres sabidos. O dia efêmero e azul encampou a noite longa de solidão. I will try to, to read in English. Day by day, the summer night anticipated the immensity of the day, an ordinary day of work, of small progress, of fulfilled duties, of known flavors. The ephemeral and blue day took up the long night of loneliness. And uh, I read a poem, the Barrocão Street. This is the street that I have, I was born in this street in my city, Teresina, Piauí. Barrocão Street. In my childhood backyard, so many red and white guavas have been spread. On the terrace of my adolescence, among soccer balls and glass marbles, such solid friendship have been grew. Nowadays, I already a mature man, I still sow dreams and I wait for fruits. Do you want to, Adrian, do you want to read in English the next one? Sure. The, I, nenhuma I, carta em seu nome. I read in Portuguese. Yes, no okay. letter, no letter in my name. That's the title. I will read in Portuguese and then yes, you read in English. Let's okay, do the thank you. Of reading that way. You read in Portuguese and I'll read the English. Go ahead. Nenhuma carta em meu nome. De soslaio a memória de teu rosto, cravado na rocha da ausência. Fotografia. O vento quente sopra a cor do esquecimento. Sombria melancolia do dia a dia. Tentei entender teu nome e nossos minutos como se houver a fruta na fruteira de minha existência. O domingo desabitado fareja o ronco do motor de meu carro empoeirado. Nada, nada além de silêncio e pó. Há mais de um ano, nenhuma carta em meu nome. And the translation in English is no letter in my name. Sideways, the memory of your face, spliced on the rock of absence. Photography, the warm wind blows the color of oblivion, somber melancholy of the day by day. I tried to understand your name and our minutes as if they had been fruit in the fruit bowl of my existence. The uninhabited Sunday sniffs out the snoring of the engine of my dusty car, nothing. Nothing but silence and dust, more than a year ago, no letter in my name. Thank you. Okay. Adelante. Con... Can you read in Portuguese? Eh? Na, tarde, yes, yes. na tarde que se avizinha. Sejamos eterna, querido, mesmo na plenitude de nossa ira. Chega de nossos discursos prontos. Não suportamos mais esperar o fim do verão. Estranhamos em silêncio o conselho dos mais velhos. Tentamos inutilmente reler os jornais passados. O que buscamos nas páginas surradas? A paisagem se adensa na geografia das ruas de nossa cidade desconhecida. Mergulhemos no assombro de nosso desejo. É sempre possível a palavra mais pura e límpida, querida mesmo fora de nosso dicionário. O cheiro do feijão em panela de ferro reacende o fogo de lenha da imaginação, o relógio da manhã. Herdeiro de nossa própria memória, divisamos a rua de nossa fraqueza e ausência na tarde que se avizinha. O leito seco do rio aguarda estações chuvosas nas cabeceiras. Depositemos, pois, iguarias e provisões na vazante de nossas horas. 
sejamos eterna, querida, mesmo na finitude de nosso dia. In, in the coming afternoon, let's be eternal, my dear, even in the fullness of our wrath. Enough of our ready speeches. We can't stand waiting for the end of summer. We suspect silently the elders' advice. We have tried ruthlessly to reread the old magazines. What do we look for in the shabby pages? The landscape becomes thicker in the streets geography of our unknown city. Let us immerse ourselves in the astonishment of our desire. The most pure and clear word is always possible, my dear, even out of our dictionary. The smell of the beans in an iron pan rekindles the wood fire of the imagination. The morning clock airs of our own memory. We see the street of our weakness and absence in the coming afternoon. The dry bed of the river awaits the rainy season at the headwaters. So let us lay up delicacies and provisions in the ebb of our hours. Let's be eternal, my dear, even in the finitude of our day. Thank you. Thank you. And now, now Marwan. Minha senhora, não trago na sacola esmola, trago apenas poesia, minha senhora. Não trago no corpo estovo, trago apenas magia, minha senhora. Não trago na voz algo feroz, trago apenas cantoria, minha senhora. Não trago na mão flores, trago apenas amores, minha senhora. Não trago no olho maldade, trago apenas saudade, minha senhora. Não trago na vida glórias, trago apenas memórias, minha senhora. I have to just say that it's a beautiful song you just sung this, Marcos. Uh, the, the version in English, this is, uh, these are your own translations, right? I, uh, my lady. Now the word arms, A-L-M-S, I never ah, know how to okay. pronounce it. Uh, I do not bring arms in the bag. I only bring poetry, my lady. I do not bring hindrance in my body. I only bring magic, my lady. I do not bring something fierce in my voice. I bring only singing, my lady. I do not bring flowers in my hand. I only bring love, my lady. I do not bring wickedness in my eyes. I only bring truth, my lady. I do not bring glory in life. I only bring back memories, my lady. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And I don't know if I have more time. You, uh, you can read, yes, please go ahead. You can you can read the next one from in English direct. I guess so I'm big long. Without you don't want to read the Portuguese? Okay. As you uh, Lavora de Galaxies. Yeah, it's up to you. Please. You can re read in English, please. Okay. Uh, the title in English is Galaxies Tillage. My mum has been gone without really telling me goodbye. The poet became hoarse, the poet became deaf. Being strong was necessary, not crying was necessary. I cried. Everyday life became a void among months of the year, sky, boredom, fish, clouds and the gray river, streets and squares without names on the plates. Dreams, key, open stars, galaxies. I don't choke anymore, mum, only with the hiccup of your departure to the worlds of the winds. The terrace of my childhood must always be the opening of your smile, sweet, simple. Sundays will be aurora, locomotives sprouting in rose bushes, cared for in the garden at home. One day, unintentionally, I will invent words and sounds. When I was born, I cried. The hours, there will be a clock to measure them. Patinas of a large closet filled with fine Chinese porcelain. Mere memories of voices and silences. 
diaphragmatic air roots, microvilli of dreams, breath of fright beyond. In the infinite stillness of the empty room, where shall we organize your slippers under the bed from now on? What could be sewn on the old singer machine? Our old children's clothes. You pick up, I know, mum, in the new harp, subtle sounds of galaxies, eternal snaps of love. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. I think we have time for, a, uh, just to finish, you have one, two short poems to go. Go ahead, Marcos. E mais não tem. Do fruto, carne e caroço, e mais não tem. Da pele, beijo e tato, e mais não tem. Da terra, alma e gema, e mais não tem. Do ventre, Deus e sopro, e mais não tem. And nothing else. From the fruit, flesh and stone, and nothing else. From the skin, kiss and touch, and nothing else. From the land, soul and yoke, and nothing else. From the womb, God and breath, and nothing else. And now, uh, uh, el último. Your, your... Último. Ah, no, sorry, there are two more to go. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah? Yeah. As, as palavras. Eh, a Cecília Meirelles. As palavras voam em cada passo de estrada, em cada chão, em cada nada. As palavras como que formigas enfileiradas. As palavras como águias esfomeadas, flanando quase sem peso no ar. As palavras rangendo o cântico do cosmo, abismo infinito, em todo vácuo, em todo nada. Words, uh, dedicated to Cecilia Mireles. Words fly at each road step. Sorry, words fly at each road step on each floor, on each nothing. Words like ants lined up, words like hungry eagles flanking almost weightless up in the air, words squeaking the song of the cosmos, infinite abyss in every vacuum, in all nothing. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And did you want to read the last poem or shall we stop there? I think you yeah. might want to read it. Go ahead. I can read the song. Yeah. Estado democrático de poesia. Que não se organize a poesia em parágrafos, mas em versos e não versos. Que nas intermináveis listas e considerandos, considerem-se todas as formas de poesia. Que nunca mais se torturem as palavras, que se abominem as quadrilhas, somente as quadras serão permitidas. Que não se dilapide o patrimônio poético nacional, que se preserve o direito da palavra de ir e vir, e voar, caso queira. Uh, this one is called the democratic state of poetry. That poetry shall not be organized in paragraphs, but in verses and no verses. That in the endless lists of recitals shall consider all poetry forms, that words will never be tortured again, that the gangs be abominated only a gang of verses will be allowed, that the national poetic heritage does not squander, that the words right to come and go and fly shall be preserved if it wants. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll... Muito obrigado. Eu que agradeço. Thank you, Duran. Thank you, Sudip. That was wonderful, Marcos. Wonderful. And the translations are also really, really, really precise. I mean, are these your all? These are your translations? Yes, I I have a help from Beatriz Santos, an English student, and and I, I have first all the translated all. Yeah, the 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 the, the, the stanza eleven from uh, Galaxy's Tillage. In the, in the infinite stillness of the empty room, where shall we organize your slippers under the bed from now on? My goodness, my goodness. Where do you get those lines from, right? But you know, your poetry brings so many different sorts of things all in one place. Of course, you know, we can 
understand that by the sort of provenance at, at the same time, the sorts of things you're involved in, you're not just for it, so to speak, like some, you know, you, you know, you, so t tell us, tell us how different strands of your professional life, uh, life feed your poetry, because I can see two things. One is the sort of very wise, um, ethereal, uh, poetic, song-like quality that exists in your poetry. And the other one is a sort of very industrial and specific, ecologically exact aspect. So talk us how you marry these two wonderful sides together. Uh, it's very difficult to, to speak. Uh, I, I, I am civil engineer. Né? I, have, I work with water. Né? I work by the National Water Agency. I have a postgraduate course in this area. And Zeit Schreider, I write in 10 years. When I was 10 years old, I began to write poetry. Uh, my father is all poetry. My grandfather was poetry and all the family. <laughs> and first the tradition, tradition and the family. And I try to, to put all not this uh, logical, uh, the, the origin from the engineer, uh, mathematics. I work off in informatics, computer language. And I try to put all together. I don't know <laughs> how can I explain. And I, I try out to, to write another language, you know, to, to, to learn it. Yeah. I have been, I was, have been lived five years in Germany yeah, for my doctor, a PhD program. And I try to, to learn another language you know, and try to translate all from another language to Portuguese and all the poems from Portuguese to another language. I have all translated in Dutch, all in Germany, English. And I think it's very interesting to, to learn more and more another tradition, another poetry from another language. Marcus, do you also write in, in, in these other languages directly? Yes, I try to do so directly in, in the language. Okay. And this is a book, uh, Staubend Schott. I have all the poems directed in the, or the language that I, Italian and all in French, in Germany. So you're a, you're a one man band response to the Tower of Babel, then, right? I mean, you're you're going to you're fighting back with your. Uh, yeah, I think it's enough for to to learn in English, né? The, yeah, no, I mean, I, the, I support poetry, your initiatives. Yeah. I mean, I I also write in other languages, and I and I celebrate that. But uh, it's tough, um, and you have to you have to be a, some modest and move on and, and receive support and criticism. And that's good. That's good. They're wonderful poems, a beautiful book. I, I, I would say that they, there are a few places where you could, uh, we could touch up the, the, the English a bit, but that's just, uh, you know, naturally as I'm reading it, I found myself modifying a line here and there, but, but that's as you process, as you go through them or have them polish them up for, for publication eventually, uh, have another look here and there. Um, yes. I think I, I think it, they are great poems and um, and thank thank you. And you know, I have a question very quickly, but it's an important question. I think it has to do with Brazil in the world map, literature map. You know, because I I have an impression that Brazilian literature is not celebrated enough. It's not known in the marketplaces of England, of London and New York and Paris or wherever uh, the marketplaces are that determine what is world literature. I just don't think we have enough of Brazilian literature available to us. And is it a problem of translation or is it a problem of, of attitudes towards the, the writer among the sort of the cultural um, 
purveyors of you know the, I, I just I don't know if you have any thoughts on that question because you're you're a pioneer in a sense crossing borders bringing your literature and Brazilian literature to available to others but I I I fear that we more needs to be done and more work needs to be made available uh, and uh, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that question in the competition for for space intellectual psychic emotional space where 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 does brazilian literature stand in this in the world map is that if you I feel like we back. have a, a lot of very good poetry uh, uh, i think it's the language by here and uh, language uh, the translations i think it's the basic problem uh, to to spread overall and the, I think we are not connected with the great uh, market in you know, literature market at the world. Yeah. I think uh, we have only a few Portuguese poetry have uh, translated in another language. Yeah. I think uh, the Brazilian government could uh, help you know, with the program to translate program into another language. As I think it's a, it's a problem. We we don't have a no Nobel Prize. Brazil. Right, there's never been a Nobel Prize. But, yes, yeah. but I think it, we have a very good poetry that could have gained the Nobel Prize if it is more become more translated and more. It's spread it up the words. I think okay. so. Well, we'll do our part to spread the word. But <laughs> thank you. I try to do so. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you. for the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos, for coming on. In fact, uh, we've discovered so many other sides of poets as we've done these programs that maybe one episode, they should come as a different avatar. Maybe Pauline should come as a painter, you should come on as a musician, you know, as a second sort of reappearance. Um, and and so many of us also translate. So, you know, if, uh, Anthony, we're talking about Dom Moraes. I mean, we can do a whole program on, on Moraes, for instance, or Lal Dead, or so many people, all of us have done. Um, so yeah, lots of, uh, you know, op opportunities for the future. One of the big privileges I feel, and Indran, I know you must be sharing this with me, is the way we do this program, Indran brings two poets and I bring in two poets for this. We never ever had a conflict uh, all our lives uh, because we trust each other's judgment. And if you've not known the poet before, either of us, I feel it's such a privilege. Um, every time I go back with two new friends, after yes. every program. And the friendship then evolves because the poetry first seizes you. And then of course you naturally keep in touch. Um, so now Tom Phillips, Tom Edward Phillips, he is relatively a new friend, but it seems like I've known this man forever because you know, with poetry, we ended up chatting on Facebook Messenger for hours. And he said, listen, I have to teach a class, but let's just do it on another day. So he'll have a tall glass of Bulgarian lager, which makes me very jealous when he speaks to me. And we endlessly talk about poetry and so on. So, you know, these are wonderful, wonderful, you know, moments and just really wonderful to share each other's friends. I think that's the biggest, you know, gift we have taken back, uh, Indra, and I think you would agree. Yeah, yeah. So Tom, you're next. Um, um, he's English um, from Reading, but he's been living in Sofia, Bulgaria for the longest time and he's done a lot a lot for Bulgarian literature. Um, let me put up the bio first. Um, and I'll just read it out formally because I think it's important to read out bios formally. Tom Edward Phillips is a writer, translator, and lecturer born in the UK, but now living in Sofia, Bulgaria. He has a PhD in creative writing from the University of Reading and a BA in English from uh, English literature from the University of Cambridge. His poetry has been published in a wide range of magazines, anthologies, and pamphlets, 
as well as in full length collections, burning Omaha recreation ground, unknown translations. His translations of contemporary and modernist B Bulgarian poetry have been widely published, while his essays on the representation of Southeast Asian um, Europe in English language literature have appeared in a range of academic publications. He's the editor of a critical study of the UK born poet, Peter Robinson, your PhD advisor, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Various papers uh, at a number of international conferences. And if you need to know anything about Bulgarian poetry, Tom's the man, you know, <laughs> apart from English poetry, because one of the things he does promote very, very acutely is the sort of literary magazines which necessarily don't always get talked about, say, like Stand or Poetry Review or Agenda, but magazines like The High Window, Racine, were doing incredible cutting edge stuff. And thank you, Tom, for uh, you know, introducing me to those magazines. You know, it's a real treat to read them. Uh, in fact, one of them doesn't do online issues. They're still sticking to the old fashioned, properly printed journal format you know, elegant typeface, you know, it almost looks like letterpress, you know, for formatting. Yeah. Tom, all yours, a very, very warm, uh, warm welcome um, to you. Thank you so much, Shadeep. Uh, as you say, I've enjoyed our conversation so much. It feels like I've known you for decades. Um, and, and, and thank you so much for inviting me here. And it, you know, I just feel listen to all you know Ranjit and Pauline and, and, and Marcus's poetry it just it makes me feel very honoured to be in this company. And um, uh, so I'm going to read um, a little group of poems which I hadn't really thought of, in fact, as being a group until um, the editor of the magazine, The High Window, that you mentioned, um, accepted them, and they're going to be published as, as a group in September. And he kind of said, I, I, I was really interested in how they're a group. And I'm not sure whether they are or not, but we'll see. Um, so the first, first poem, um, as Shadeep said, I, I live in Sofia in Bulgaria and, and have done for four years. Um, and, and this uh, poem really, uh, almost like a diary really about one of the periods we were uh, emerging from lockdown here. Um, uh, uh, and the poem is called Making Light of the part of me that's had enough has had enough again. The sky's a dirty visor, car brakes scrape like stropping razors. Still, I'm walking. Can work, take cash from my wallet and pay more. Though it's not my shout, pub, or bar, fixture, mon frere. You're not here. Like another who, rising at his own funeral, called, whose round is it? And back came our reply, it's yours. Two faces in the off-license window stare out, propped up on palms, waiting for an Edward Hopper to glance from the umbrellas. Hard rain falls. The crossing's inviting me over. Hey, is the brand on the scooped convenient thing that sits behind convenient glass. Wanting coins, I dig out, putting a few in their place, securing a better purchase. Under appropriate lighting, that waste bin may be more than what we've left in it, below snow-caped slopes where distances converge. Jay shriek, jive, lack means to make good territories. Scant food in this wood, though finches endure until they find it. Wait, what hand has dug a hole among the poplars, damp as a sump, and to what end? Tilth heats, grounds turned, rims of fountains frosted, a warehouse on the brink slumps to rust, it's lost to all purpose. As wide as the forest, a hillside of lies memorialized in small fine print. Fearless nor faithless, we defer to what's clearing in the brightening air, now everything's been paid for. And it has, if that's the price of our final truth, their peace that passes all understanding. Haunting graveyards again, it's like that time, a birthday, Walking out of Tenby, we found headstones mounted in a wall reclaimed from land rewilding, which has got us thinking here or there. Not so far as we go, a deepening view unfurls as a billowing sail. Still, the rain falls. 
still in the off-license window, sitting on high stools, friends with hair pulled tight, stir their coffees and wait. And whatever it is at hand is all we'll get. Bows drawn to the wet street sheen, its patina of spattered neon. Taxis veering through puddles, spray pavement and sheaves. Clouds build their own mountains, though the day's solitary jet breaks looming cover to streak blue patches with contrails. Pitching over Sophia, it banks then steadies the final approach. A coach sits tight in a bay. No way to see how that will out. Thoughts run so far. Snag, trail tendrils, trail off, lose their lightness of touch. Let us count our blessings in this stand of birch. Wrinkled under glass, a timetable, its figures rewritten in other hands, a palimpsest, abandoned railway station spaces, the cashier's desk, locked toilet door, the forgotten attend cafe tables outside, waiting rooms proliferate. The sounding bells recall priests on the run to make only just an evening service. So yes, friend, you've gone, and what you've missed is our allegiances the last glass filled, contingencies of place and time. Fine, dead finch on the pavement, request for a carrier bag, cues to pay at the gas station with a contact with card. The arch of the bridge drips disowned ambition, lacks geometrical standards. Herd instinct works against the shepherd. You can see how it's written, his want of calm as his charges do just that. They butt, bleat, rear on the roadway, Leave printed traces, smutted snow. It's all go. And they might have gone some time ago, were it not the seasons inexplicably changing and autumn clinging on. Dust mates, just watch, don't jostle, don't jostle, nor birds aligned in flight collide. We have circuitry. The dead good avoid what's left. A cemetery is a map of achievements. Hey, what's still on sale sounds like a ricochet the held onto that we've never got, or what we're going to buy in the here and now. Wine glass on a gravestone, necrologues on doorposts, a way to manage things. There's food up here and stood at the monastery gate, a priest with arm in a cast. He merely wants to say how in the sky he saw a sign too late. And he might have there on the sun split trees were it not for what cries that you're terrible posthumous joke. Thank you. Um, I, I should have said really at the beginning that's also that's kind of like a diary poem which is kind of merged as a, an elegy for a very good friend of mine who died a few years ago. Uh, he's like the mon semblable mon flair um, who, I, who I mentioned at the beginning. <clears throat> so um, the second poem in this group that I want to read is, is perhaps a from a kind of different experience, this is about going to the seaside in Bulgaria um, during a pandemic, which is a kind of strange experience. Um, uh, and, and we went to a very, very popular resort called Albania, um, uh, and uh, which is actually, of course, where all the criminal oligarchs go uh, on holiday, but I hadn't known that at the time. Um, so this poem is, well, they don't really, uh, I'm exaggerating. Um, uh, this poem is just all favors. And it comes then, rolling to a curl, broiling at head height, hurling through. We dot the sea, thought complex as interference between sky shelter, gulls dinning clatter, rattle of coins on a kiosk counters too distant to matter. Tide turns, dogs leap, barking into breeze whose careless force whips undefeated barefoot miners scouring shore. Irreparable chance scuffs rock curves, stubborn, stubborn as grace, warning too soon. Seas reassemblage towards air cures, undertow unfelt, an unforeseen step, waist deep in ocean's sharp green distance. Okay, and um, finally, uh, I have this rather, um, uh, this, this, this one I'm gonna end with is actually that somewhere else, it's actually sat in, well, I guess North Carolina, really, um, which is somewhere I went, went as a child with my father. Uh, and we, we went and stayed with some of my father's friends. And um, 
it's now occurred to me because he worked for uh, BOAC or British Airways as it became um, and flew to Moscow a lot and had friends who appeared to be members of the CIA um, that he, he might have been actually engaged in some quite interesting activity. So this is kind of a poem which is me kind of playing around with that, that kind of idea. So it's based on a real experience from when I was a child, but it, it's kind of you know, building on that. And the poem is called Damned as Well. Um, uh, and that's actually, uh, I can't remember if I sent the version with the little uh, uh, quote at the beginning, um, because that comes from a song uh, called The House That Jack Kerouac Built uh, by the Australian band, The go Between. Um, so I, I put originally as a sort of epigraph to this poem, another line from, another couple of lines from that song, and it, it just says, you're reading me poetry that's Irish and so black. Um, so perhaps there's a bit of kind of Irish, in I, I'm also of Irish descent way back, so that's a bit of that. Uh, so this is damned as well. The road sign read Eden, a lane crooked through marshland. Egrets, waterways, stench of diesel at wharf's end. And their house, triumphant, built on the peak of an isthmus, such view and their lives as if perpetually surprised by uncertain completion or the clothes they stood up in, circling a design, adventurous in its sunken furnishing. Terra incognita here be dragons or ruined reed bed, as it happens. Not on the brochure, certainly, an old clock stands in the corner, snap shut clacks the pelican's beak. One delta to another, he said, crew cut hellhole to paradise, or well, that's the implication of Bourbon with Lord Brown. Who knows where he's been, that there were so many dead. A catfish, discolored, hauled up a bank, its greasy torso hid in seared reeds, backdrop of cranes, factory plumes, a naval base. Reflected clouds refract in slicks of oil. Where does this river run? A tributary of a tributary creaking like foil all the way back up to its source. The thing was to turn away and not look, to make no form from what was said. The road sign read Eden, such Eden. Crook up he stood, friend of the friend of my father, back from somewhere with so many dead. And that catfish, discolored, hid in reeds dried out beside the foil creek. Thank you. There we are. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you have one short poem in passing, maybe. Oh, oh yes, uh, yeah, no, I, I'll read that too, yeah, okay. Um, yes, because there's time. Um, okay, uh, this poem, um, I mean, I, I've been dating my poem um, quite a lot lately and I think that's perhaps something maybe I don't know the interest in that other poets are feeling the same need to sort of have to I, I write it at the end of them like Sophia 5th of September 2020 as if to remind myself that you know time actually happens um, so um, this uh, this poem is called In Passing uh, and it's very specifically dated um, it's dated the 31st of January uh, 2020, which, um, in case you're not aware, is the day um, that the absolute disaster that is Brexit um, uh, came into effect. Uh, I, indeed, we live in Bulgaria now because of that. Um, <laughs> we want to be Europeans. We don't want to be isolated on a rather small island. Anyway, <laughs> that's another story. Um, so this is my kind of, this is almost like an allergy as well, I think. Um, so it's kind of circular and, and perhaps but an elegy for something a little bigger. Um, and it's just called um, In Passing. The first sight of dry patchwork rolling out beneath us, or unfamiliar words murmured at zinc bar counters. Peeling skin on my back like an unfolding map or yellow acres of sunflower spacing up to the sky. Sporadic glimpses of a slow moving river through slits set into the curves of a staircase. Terracotta pigeons on terracotta tiles, or icons glinting through incense and gloom. 
a late tram rattling through lamp-lit suburbs, or an oily plane flying over low city rooftops. Those spiraling conversations lasting all night, or the plangent musk of newly poured wine, the passing last whistle of a passing last train. Those days we needed nobody's leave to remain. Beautiful uh, finish, Tom, and beautiful poetry. Thank you. Um, Thank you very I, much. I'll, let me just ask uh, the question which you raised by mentioning Brexit. And so January 31, 2020 was the day uh, of the departure from Brexit. Um, I mean, it that's just like the official end, you know. Right. But of course, it, it so now that I, when I read the poem, I, I, I think of that and, and the passing last whistle of a passing last train takes on all <laughs> that a new meaning, you know. So uh, do you think poems are temporal in that sense, tied to incidents and events, or can they both be that and universal um, and timeless and, and where January 31 means, could be January 30 or could be, I mean, just, if you could just reflect on that question and when you write a poem, are you writing on that day for that, day's audience, or are you somehow both doing that and reaching people way into the future? Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a really interesting and, in fact, um, very pertinent question to what I'm thinking about now. Um, and I think I always have written very much from um, the idea of a, of a very specific occasion for a poem. If you know what I mean, you know, they, they, they have nearly always emerged from something, you know, so that big long poem I read at the beginning, you know, I, I could do a sort of exegesis explaining, you know, like where the off license is. And yes, there really were two girls sat in the window and like that stand of birch trees is in a little town called Stogge just up the road and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, it, and that interests me. I, 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 I'm really interested in, in work that kind of comes from uh, very specific locations and times and that kind of idea that you're, that you're sort of finding them. You know, there's another poem I've written um, which has some light, which has a little section where I kind of talk about, oh, I think there might be a poem in this kind of arrangement of balconies or whatever, or something, I can't remember quite. And, you know, and it sort of ends rather ironically because I just kind of go, ah, missed it. <laughs> Walk too fast, missed the poem. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, I think it's important. I mean, and, and one of the challenges for me is writing things which do come from very specific and, and effectively autobiographical experiences, but hopefully making them of interest to other people so that they can then find something in them. Um, uh, you know, I wrote a whole series just on my balcony, right, in, 20, in the summer of 2019. I just sat, it's like a little documentary, you know, it's like, it was the, the first poem is about our neighbour's dog, kind of, you know, dropping a piece of pizza on the pavement. Um, and I think I've been very influenced by Frank O'Hara on that, you know, that, that kind of thing. And the... Italian neorealist cinema or something, I don't know. Some... Yeah, Italian, and, and, and I think it's coming and it's becoming more obvious in the stuff, I think, that because I'm now, you know, over the last few years, I've been reading a lot more poetry from other places, in other languages, other cultures and so on, and, and kind of picking up things. And, and kind of quite a lot of contemporary Bulgarian poetry, for example, is, is quite often very, quite specific. You know, about where it's a starting point. I think of Christopher Isherwood when you know that line, "I am a camera," right? You know that begins. Uh, it's it's uh, the Berlin or the Weimar Republic that's disappearing, and here you are, uh, a reporter in a sense for the world in in a particular place in in Sofia, a country that's not, let's say, widely known about yeah. or known of. Uh, it's uh, just very quickly. I mean, I know a Bulgarian poet who's translating from into Spanish and, and Bulgarian, bringing poets from Colombia and Bulgarian poets together. So I'll, I'll put you in touch with her later, but- um, I, I think I might know, who is oh, that? Alexandra Evtimova, you know her, okay. 
I think well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. But, well, no, do put me in touch just in case I don't. <laughs> sure. All right. Anyway. So deep. Yes, Tom. Tom, that was marvelous. I, I, of course, I'm familiar with your poetry. Um, there are so many aspects to your poetry one can talk about, but just that the way you ended the last bit, the plangent musk of newly poured wine, the passing of last whistle of a passing last train. Um, and the earlier poem, the long poem, you know, parts of it reminded me of what Walcott did in Omeros, for instance, you know, very specifically when Philoctetus um, you know the, the, the sh that the the scene shifts to the London um, uh, townscape, and mm -hmm. what you were doing as uh, as recording it in contemporary sort of uh, mise en scène. Also mm -hmm. talking about cinema because uh, Indran brought up brought up the whole idea of um, neo Italian you know movement, but I also see a lot of. I'll be very curious to see balconies because maybe there's a lot of Hitchcock's rear window there, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah, there might be, I don't know, it was, it, yeah. Um, but, I, but to go back, yes, just yeah. sorry to interrupt, but to go back to dating, I think so far you're the first poet who's been brave enough to read brand new work, you know. These are 20, 2020, 2021 poems, mm. and you've let them out, you know, clearly, and they're so well formed. Was there a reason as to why you wanted to read only new poems? Um, well, I suppose there were two reasons. One is purely, like, you know, it sounds a bit, I don't mean this to sound Arab, but, you know, there are some greatest hits. <laughs> and, um, you know, I didn't really want to just read those because there were film of me doing those and stuff. And, you know, I read a couple last night of reading here and so on. So I kind of do try and now read newer work. And I, and there's a more, there's a perhaps a more a kind of selfish reason in the way I wanted to hear how they sounded. I haven't ever read those three poems too. I mean, I've read them aloud to myself, but not, not to other people. Um, and I think sometimes that, you know, like kind of live reading is a good place to actually read new work. Um, uh, and, and, you know, mix the two. I mean, I used to make a joke when I was reading in, in Britain. I used to say, now, here's the most frightening thing you're ever going to hear. This is a poem I just finished. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like, um, <laughs> give, at least give us one or two of the ones that are, but, and I, and I felt confident about these because, as I said at the beginning, you know, David Cook at the High Windows has accepted them for publication, and he's an extremely good judge of stuff, so I was fairly confident about it. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that ties all of you together is the attention to the sonic quality of poetry. Um, I bring that up because I want to introduce this idea of editing poetry and when um, Indran remarked on Marcos's English versions and he said that, you know, there are perhaps one or two words or phrases that might need tinkering. It Marcos actually, it's a, one of, I find it really useful when one reads out poetry out aloud, what to edit out and what to keep in because the tonality you hear from, you, you know, is so integral to what should remain on the page. And I see that across all four, four poets, both in translation as well as in the original, how sound is so important. So briefly, can you all say, talk about how sound affects your editing, very spe specifically starting with Ranjit and Pauline and Marcos and then Tom. Well, sound is absolutely key, it's, it's primary in some ways. So to me, it has to sound right. It has to, it has to persuade me. And it has to be a, it has to be a kind of sound that moves across registers. Increasingly, this is my preoccupation. So yeah, so I find this very, very useful actually, reading it out, literally projecting it, sharing it, and uh, hearing uh, how it's responded to. And uh, Equally, uh, you know, and this has been a feast, a sonic feast in that sense. Just so many different tonalities and registers and uh, concerns that, that uh, you know, each brings its own musicality. Yeah. 
Pauline, do you have do you have any thoughts on this? <clears throat> Un poco lo que entiendo, eh, Indran, about the music of poetry in uh, uh, different languages or poet or poet from different places. That is the question. Yeah, just uh, uh, yes, you, 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 that is, 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 a mí lo que me, más me llama la atención es eh, escuchar, eh, cómo, en realidad, ¿cómo escucho? Eh, creo que en algún sentido es bueno el no comprender completamente el poema porque el intelecto no, no interfiere. Ok, oh, un segundo. So, she's saying, how, how does one listen to a poem? It, it, perhaps it's a good thing not to understand it. Uh, completely, because the intellect is not uh, everything that's involved in appreciating a poem. Entonces, entonces puedo, puedo observar la sensación que me llega del poema. So she can observe or feel the sensation that comes from the poem. Go ahead. Eh, puedo comprender algunas eh, directrices claves del poema, para dónde va. She can understand certain key sort of indicators in the poem, where the poem is going. Y puedo observar la actitud del poeta. And she can sort of observe the, the attitude of the poet. Yeah. Entonces me llega la poesía desde, creo que desde donde está creada realmente. Desde... So she thinks that the poem arrives from where she believes it's created. Yeah. Inside. Inside. In, in the, the, yeah, inside, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Marcos. Uh, yes, I think it's very interesting when you hear another poetry in another language. Né? I think it's very important to, the sonority, né? the orality from the poem. Né? Although uh, sometimes you can really understand all the words and all, but you, you can feel the poems. Né? I think it's very important. I have some poetry and uh, that is visual poetry as the uh, concrete, né? like uh, the Arode de Campos, the, the Campos, the Brazilian poets, né? the concrete poesy. But uh, I, I think we organize some poetry reading né? And, uh, here in Brazil in the National Library. And it's, I think it's good when you read that there's a sonority, then I think it's very important to, to the soul, né? from the reading, from, from the words. And so I, I, I think it's feel good. Yes. Uh, just oh. to, uh, sorry, uh, just Marco, just very quickly, you mentioned concrete poetry. And hearing the concrete poem out loud was uh, a very positive thing for you in the in the reading, and, right? Okay, I understood your question. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I, I'm going to say what, what the others have said too, and um, I suppose just to sort of add something new, I, I've become much more aware of it from my work as a translator. Um, um, and I've been working on a, a Bulgarian, uh, on the work of a Bulgarian modernist poet called Gea Milev, um, who um, was kind of, well, he was killed at a very young age by a right-wing government. And, and in his brief 30 years, he wrote some extraordinary poems. And if you hear them read in Bulgarian, they just sound extraordinary. And try, sort of trying to translate that into English and then Sort of replicate or at least do something similar with the sound has really alerted me a lot more to the kind of importance of, of and how and how it might work in poetry. Yes, yes. I think I think I think I, I think Marcos, you said this. That, or was it Pauline that it's so important, in fact, to hear poetry, regardless of whether you understand it. You know, in in terms of when it's being read out in another language, 
because you just sort of soak in the musicality, the words. It's uh, visceral in many ways. And then rereading and rehearing it and mishearing also is so important, I think. You know, it uh, adds to the sort of patina of, you know, the poem itself. And uh, I think what connects all of you and all of us is the solidarity through words and sound and, and mishearings and, and words and languages. It's just been a really, really wonderful, wonderful evening. As always, we always want to end it at one hour, 30 minutes, but we end up going to two hours every time. <laughs> but then that talks about, you know, the, you know, the quality of work you guys just put together every time. So from my part, uh, thank you very, very much, Ranjit Hoskote, um, uh, Pauline Leroy, Marcos Freitas, Tom, Edward, Phillips, and Indran and I are always very thrilled to have you all. And uh, Don Krieger, who's quietly, you know, you know, is the engine behind this, you know, transmission. And you'll see tomorrow the number of places it's actually put across to. It's just stunning, you know, the platforms he puts them to. But thank you once again for a very, very beautiful evening. And it's good night from New Delhi. It's 10.33 where we are. And, <laughs> <laughs> and hope thank you so much. Thank yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a lovely, lovely morning for me and <laughs> evening for you. <laughs> thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. See you all. Cheers. Fantastic. Good. Okay. Thank you very much.